Welcome to the show. We're at Chai with Lakshmi Life, the first of a series of amazing conversations that are happening offline and with an audience. My guest today is Sinu Joseph. But before I tell you about the amazing work that she does, let me set a context to her work. At least 23% of girls in India leave school when they start menstruating. Only 70% of Indian women can afford sanitary pads. In a country that celebrates motherhood, menstruation that causes it in the first place is a matter of shame, a matter to be dealt with in silence, and a matter that is considered dirty. In most parts of India, hitting puberty doesn't just mean beginning the process of becoming a woman. It also means the beginning of a long phase of life that is muddled with humiliation. Taboos about menstruation are compounded by the lack of proper sanitation across the country. Cervical cancer, which is mainly caused by the human papilloma virus infection, is the leading cancer amongst Indian women and is a direct result of their ignorance on menstrual health and hygiene. Now let me get to today's guest. Sinu Joseph has, has in her own personal capacity educated over 6,000 young girls in rural and semi-urban Karnataka through school classrooms on menstrual health and hygiene. Her work is amazing. Take a look. When Sinu Joseph chanced upon the dire need for girls and women to know about menstrual health, she went out and served to that need. In the last three years, Sinu has educated over 6,000 young girls through rural and semi-urban school classrooms on menstrual health and hygiene. She has helped them understand their own bodies, has dispelled myths, and is lowering their chances of prolonged UTIs and cervical cancer. Sinu has now created a regional language animated film that will help her reach millions of girls and women in Karnataka. Sinu is an individual, a woman for women, and hers is an idea that could be replicated in every state in India. young girls in Karnataka yeah. in the matter of just three years. Yeah. That is not a joke. I think that's amazing. That probably means you went to hundreds, if not at least a thousand or more than a thousand different classrooms. And uh, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Lakshmi. Nice to be here. Uh, tell me, how did this begin, though? How did it start and how did you get through to so many young girls? I was working as a volunteer in a government school in Malleshwaram, and uh, I was teaching spoken English at that time. So we had a class of about 50 students, of which there were only four girls. And of these four girls, two suddenly dropped out of school. So I asked her friends what, what really is happening, and they said, no, she's attained puberty, and so her mother thinks that it's better she stays at home. And I said, that's a little odd. And I'm sure someone must be talking to these girls about it. They were high school girls there. So the first thing I did was that I went to the school teachers, the lady teachers, and I said, don't you talk to girls about menstruation? And they said, chi chi chi, they now matadala. We don't talk about these things. I said, can you arrange for someone to talk about it? Of course, later I found out that the government school teachers are in fact trained to do these talks. There's a program called Kelu Kishori under which they're supposed to do these talks but very few of them actually do it because they feel very awkward to talk about it themselves. So when they said bring in an expert at that point, of course, I did not know. And like most people, I thought these talks have to be done by a doctor. So I called a doctor to do this talk, a lady doctor, a pediatrician. And she walked into the classroom. I had gotten all the girls from high school. And the first thing she said to the kids in Canada, she said, this is a topic that I feel really ought to talk about, and I understand if you feel the same. And that was it. The slightest chance of any girl opening up and talking about it was nicely killed and buried. Of course, she did a good talk. She drew the uterus. She spoke about the ovary, and she spoke about the egg and the sperm. And most of the girls kind of fell asleep. That's when we realized that no, menstruation is not just about the biological aspects. There is a lot more to it. Girls and women need to be able to talk about it. It's a natural biological process. And why isn't anyone talking about it? Even an educated person like a doctor feels ought to talk about it. So 
So that's when uh, my colleague Vaijayanti and I, we decided that let's figure out how this needs to be done ourselves. So we actually went from school to school. We did more of the talks in rural schools, started to talk to girls about what is really happening. And it wasn't so much that we give them information, but it was more about what do they want to know about menstruation. And believe me, nobody will ask you how does it work. No one will ask you about the biological aspects. They just want to know, well, what do I do when I get my period? <laughs> that was their basic question, which not really, people weren't really addressing. So yeah, that's how we started. Fabulous. And, and what motivated you to go out there to each of these hundreds or maybe over a thousand classrooms, one by one, and talk to these students one on one, in your own strength, out of your own resources? There are a lot of reasons, of course. My own childhood, I attained puberty at a very early age of 11 and a half. And I was honestly a child in a woman's body. That can be very difficult, right? Because your body is developing and you're growing, but mentally you're just a child. And all of a sudden you're told, don't wear short skirts, sit this way, don't talk to boys. So I have been through some of that myself. And I know how difficult it is for girls to talk about it. I mean, forget girls. I've done training sessions in IT companies for corporate heads, women who are in senior positions. And when I do the training, they all come and say, oh, okay, so we have to go to some village and tell some girl about menstruation. I said, no, you have to talk about your period first. And then they all look away and they look down and they look everywhere but at me. Women can't talk about it. Educated women, grown up women. And that is what we needed to change. And for me, when I know what it did to me, and I could see that the same was happening for so many girls, and all the more so in rural areas, I just could not not act. <laughs> it's fabulous that you did act, and it's, and it's amazing that you were able to go to so many places and talk to so many young girls. And I'm sure you have your scary stories, not just, not just in terms of reaching out to these schools in the first place and, and trying to get through and trying to have these sessions, but also in terms of the kind of questions perhaps they ask you because you don't necessarily come from a background uh, where you were trained for this, right? You trained yourself for this. So tell me about some of the scariest things you've come across. Yeah, I think I'll probably narrate the first session that Bajinti and I did. So we went off to this rural school in Kolar, uh, the place is called Mikdur, and that school had no lady teachers, right? So it was a very tricky thing, it was a high school. There were about 70 girls and no toilets even. And no one's ever spoken to the girls. So we were the first ladies that were going in there to talk about. It was our first time too. So we walked in and the girls very hurriedly closed all the windows and doors and they said, what if sir sees? So we have to you know, shut it all out. We said, fine, if that's what makes them comfortable. And then they closed their ears, closed their eyes, <laughs> and that's it. They didn't even want to hear or look at us. We said, oh my God, now what do we do? So I've learned of the whole biological thing, right? So I'm prepared to tell them about the uterus and the ovary and the sperm and the egg. And they're not even looking at us. So that's when very spontaneously, Vaijayanti and I stood there and we started telling them about our first period. So we would start by saying, when I was your age, this is what I thought happened to me. This is how embarrassed I was about the whole thing. And these were the awkward moments that I went through. And then slowly the eyes started opening, their hands went off their ears, and they were like, oh, this Akka has been through the same things that I have. And honestly, regardless of the economic status, all women go through similar moments of embarrassment during their puberty. And this was an eye-opener even for me. And it was just wonderful how we connected with the girls just because well, when I was an adolescent, this is what happened to me. And then the girls started standing up, these very girls who would not talk. So one girl would stand up and say that when I first got my period, I was so scared. I thought I'm going to die of cancer. I thought this is what cancer is like. So I did not tell my mom because I didn't want to trouble her. And I didn't do anything for two days. And she stood up in front of the whole class and said this. And then another girl stood up and said something. And then another, and then another. So this is how we broke the ice in every session. And there were also a lot of girls who were suffering from problems. Maybe it was anemia, maybe it was some white discharge problem, and they would never seek help. I mean, if you can't even talk about something that is so natural, why will you talk about a problem that you have? 
So after a session, girls will start coming up and saying, this is a problem I have, and that's a problem, and we'll be like, please go see a doctor, and please be okay to talk about it. So yeah, I mean, there are so many stories to narrate, if I have to think of it, but uh, yeah. I think, I think uh, health issues are, are a big area of yeah. problem yeah. in this space, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned anemia, you mentioned white discharge, uh, infections. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a bigger contextual problem, and that is the cultural one. And tied in with that is the problem of awareness, uh, whether it's healthcare professionals knowing how to talk about this problem, or whether it's mothers knowing how to talk about this with their children, this topic with their children. Um, I know you've now gone on to make an animated film that anyone can watch in any village, in any rural or semi-urban context, and it's a regional language animated film. Tell me, how did you go about making that film, or what inspired that film in the first place? Because that's a huge investment to put in on your own, right? Um, even in just in terms of time, if not more. Uh, second thing, how many more people can that animated film reach? Because now you've made it. Yeah, sure. So uh, Vaijinti and I, as individuals, we've been going from school to school, and each session would be about two hours, really energetic session. Right? You have a class full of girls who are talking, who are expressing, who are coming out of their shell and are very excited. And it was exhausting for us to do it. That was one part. The other bit was we, would, we started training other volunteers to do these talks. We will give them the information, we gave them handouts. But when they went to a school, their own inhibitions came into play. And the message that they were giving to the children came more from their experience rather than the facts or what needs to be told. So that's when we realized that, one, if we need to reach out to a larger number of girls, individuals going and trying to deliver this talk, each one taking two hours, might not be the best idea. Secondly, we needed to come up with some standardization so that at least a few things are set. There are a few things which are told, which is the biological aspects, the common myths and misconceptions. That is conveyed without any confusion to the children. So that's when we thought, let's make an animated video. So we made it on a very tiny budget with a very young animator. Now, the funny thing was, uh, Peter is the animator. He's male, of course. And, uh, and very he knows shy. nothing about menstruation. He knows nothing about menstruation. And the funny part, he only speaks Tamil, not Kannada, not English. So <laughs> it was a big challenge for us to explain to him, A, what menstruation is, and B, how do you show this video? How do you make it in a form that children are OK to watch? And I had to overcome my own inhibitions there <laughs> to talk so closely with a young boy and tell him about menstruation. I mean, there was one very funny instance. I could take my husband, Vikshut, along for some of the sessions when I had to explain things to him. <laughs> Can I say this on air? Okay. Oh, right ahead. We're all listening. We've, we've so, gone into the topic anyway, so everything's okay now. This is really funny incident, right? So the video is uh, graphic and yet not vulgar because we knew that uh, in rural India, it needs to be culture sensitive. Uh, in fact, a lot of books given by UNICEF and others given to government schools, they are very graphical. They have nude pictures of men and women, and the teachers are not comfortable showing it. So these books were just lying in the shelves. So that's when we knew that, no, we had to dress up all our characters, salva, kameez, and dupatta, and all that, <laughs> <laughs> and somehow still convey the message. So this is one scene which I had to explain to him about how a cloth is to be used and placed in the undergarment. And first thing he's like, how do you use a cloth? <laughs> then I said, Peter, you fold the cloth and you put it. He's like, I'm not understanding. <laughs> I said, okay. So I took a dupatta and I folded it and I showed it to him. And he's like, ma'am, what undergarment means what, ma'am? Oh my God. I said, okay. <laughs> and my husband is sitting next to me and I'm like, okay, Peter, um, what are panties? He's like, no, ma'am. <laughs> I'm like, okay, now what do I tell him? And then my husband is like, Peter, chaddi. <laughs> and he's like, oh, chaddi, I get it now. <laughs> so, it was good to have your husband. Yeah, it was good to have <laughs> It was very odd for me also, but then we overcame it. And so Vajin and I really pulled Peter's leg, saying that now you know it all. You'll have a fantastic marriage. You'll be the most understanding husband now. <laughs> <laughs> you trained so, yeah. him well in advance. Yeah, yeah. So that's how we made the video. It was quite difficult. It took us about uh, one and a half to two years to put the whole video together with the small budget we had. And uh, it's come out better than we expected. Uh, and the most positive thing is that we released the video in June. 
and it's freely available. It's online. Anyone can download it and use it. I've already trained about 10 to 15 NGOs and given it to them. So they consider it their own and they're going out there and doing these talks. Uh, since June, we've been trying to speak to the health department, the government department, about this video so that our intention was when you make a video, it should be able to reach out to the entire state. So it's an easy thing to replicate and go out. And finally, in October, we were called. Uh, we met the principal health secretary, Dr. Madan Gopal. We met the NRHM MD, Dr. Suresh Mohammed, and fantastic response. Uh, we met them. We showed the video. They loved it because the government has a program called uh, Adolescent Reproductive and Sexual Health, ASH. And under that, menstrual hygiene is the project. So this fit beautifully into their existing work. And they've already shown it to all the ASHA workers. These are health workers in uh, rural rural India, all the ASHA workers in Karnataka, which is about 30,000 of them. They've already seen it, and very soon it will be given to all the schools in Karnataka, reaching around 22 lakh girls. That's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, so do you think there's scope then for the same animation film to be dubbed into other languages and used in neighboring states, given absolutely, a little yeah. bit of cultural relativity in terms of clothing and yeah. style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the exciting bit about making it an animated video, that uh, we can actually easily make it into other languages and uh, suit other regional contexts. So we will be doing that. The only thing is we're kind of taking it a little slow, because we were very particular that we didn't want to make a video that will go and sit in a library as a nice piece with all the other educational materials. So we've given it to the government, and they have told us, can you help us figure out how do we monitor it better? How do we make sure that actually every girl in every school sees it? And unless we figure out that entire cycle and done it in Karnataka, we don't want to simply make copies of it. Making copies is easy, but we might just wait till we figure out the whole cycle and then we will do it. Sure. Um, you mentioned that, that these CDs are being given out to ASHA workers um, and then they're going out to mm -hmm. you know, many lakhs of school mm -hmm. students or schools. What about healthcare professionals working in rural and semi-urban India? Are they also being brought into this, this program at some point? Uh, every PHC, that is primary health center, has a medical officer. And during the training of these medical officers, this video is again shown. Okay. They're also given copies of it. A uh, Couple of weeks ago, my colleague Bhaskar and I, we went to Dodbalapur. It was for another work. And uh, we were just visiting some PHCs and trying to understand what we can do there for health. Uh, so I was trying to talk to them. They weren't really connecting with us. And then I said, have you watched Maitri? The name of the video is Maitri. And suddenly their faces lit up and said, oh, yeah, what a fantastic video. It's going to be so helpful that we can go out and talk to kids. I said, I mean Maitri. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. So we didn't need to talk further. And for me, it was such a joy to see that you know, I sat here and we made something. And it's actually being used in some village where I've never been. And the doctors there and the health workers there have actually seen it, and they're waiting to get a copy of it so they can actually use it. So that was That's very fantastic. satisfying. That's yeah. fantastic. It's, it's great how you started with, with the need that you identified, and you tried to fix in your own strength. And then you moved on to finding a solution that can benefit an entire community via a whole bunch of people without your necessary personal involvement. Yeah. Now, the topic of sanitary pads, right? Uh, we've talked about this offline. The sales of sanitary protection products in India it currently is about 250 million US dollars. And this number is predicted to swell to 442 million US dollars by 2017, okay? 70% of Indian women cannot even afford a sanitary pad. I know there are ideas out, out there which are decreasing the price of sanitary pads, but you know, you've been on the ground. You've talked to young girls, you've talked to mothers, you've talked to teachers, you've talked to healthcare professionals. And you've heard scary stories to do with rats. Okay. At the same time, you have your own ideas on what is actually working and why. I'm so glad you brought this up, because this is the most important thing I want to say on this issue. We are in an age where we want instant solutions. If you take a CSR of any company and you go to them with any project, they want to see something that's tangible, right? In sanitary pads, when you talk about menstruation, Sanitary pads comes across as the first and the biggest and the nicest idea. And I myself started that way. So the first school that we did, we started by distributing sanitary napkins made by this uh, mini manufacturing unit. What we realized, Lakshmi, was that the issue isn't about sanitary pads at all. 
that is one part of it. And it's been hyped up so much because nobody wants to talk about the other aspects of menstruation. That is too difficult, that is too awkward, they don't want to go there. The sanitary pads, it's very easy. Put in some money, get some pads, distribute it to girls, matter is over. When Vaijinti and I traveled to remote tribal areas in Dan Delhi, we went to the schools and talked there. And we asked, what do you people use? And the girl said, whisper. They really use whisper. They use whisper. So the first thing is the myth that they cannot afford it. Those who want it will afford it, will find ways of getting it. So that is not the problem. That is not the reason why a large majority of girls in villages are not using sanitary napkins. It is not the money. So what is it? Why are they still using cloth? It's familiarity. Cloth is very familiar to them. They're very comfortable with it. I guess also they were right. first introduced to cloth in the first place. They were anyway. first introduced to cloth and they know how to use it. They know how frequently to change it. They know how to wash it. Of course, there were some problems in the way they would wash it and write, which is why we are there to correct those practices. But what happens when you introduce a new product? One, the environmental damage. We've all closed our eyes to it. I can't say that I work in healthcare and I, I, I give a damn about the environment. You are introducing something that is so damaging to the environment. We know how the cities are. And we are trying to do the same in the villages. The other aspect is that when something is unfamiliar, they don't always do it right. I've come across girls who think that sanitary pads are some super absorbing capacity, so they use the same pad the entire day. Whereas if it was a cloth, they'll change it four to six times. Which brings me to the question, and even us educated urban women don't know this information. Uh, and I was enlightened a few months ago. And I'm going to ask this question now <laughs> to the crowd. How many times do you think a sanitary pad needs to be changed in a day? How, how many, in how many hours should you be changing? If the men know, they can answer too. <laughs> Three, four times, okay. That's once every, yeah, that's true, okay. So that's once about every eight hours or once every six hours. Do you want to enlighten us? Yes, uh, even if the flow is very scanty, you have to change it within six to eight hours. Anything more than that, you're creating a valid criteria for infection. And the, and, and the ideal time yeah. for changing is once every four hours. Yeah, once so every four hours. And in fact, in a lot of schools, the girls feel that if they have to change once in four hours, it's actually a heavy period. No, that's perfectly normal. That's actually really good if you can change it that frequently. And many people don't know it. And the, I was very shocked when just across the border of Karnataka, I went to Maharashtra and in a village there. I was talking to the women there, not the girls, the women. And I said, so how often do you change it? They're like, oh, we use the same cloth for two days. And uh, how long have you been using this cloth? The last 10 years. I said, how is that cloth even intact? And imagine the infection. Imagine, imagine. And they don't know what problems it could cause, what it could do. And this is why we need to talk about it. Please do not reduce the issue of menstrual hygiene to sanitary pads. Because you just blind yourself to everything else. And the minute you go into a place where people aren't using it and you try to force sanitary napkins, you're, it's very disempowering. Instead, tell them with whatever they are using, how they can use it better. What type of cloth do you use? How often do you change it? How do you wash it? Where do you dry it? Give them that information. Cloth is environmental friendly. It is fine. It's easy on the skin. Some women are allergic to sanitary pads and the chemicals in it. Women are fine with cloth. In a lot of Western countries, they're turning to cloth. They're turning away from sanitary pads. And here we are stupidly promoting sanitary pads. I'm not saying that sanitary pads should not be used. I'm saying that it is a personal choice. And we have no right to dump our ideas on girls in rural areas. Absolutely. Tell them about both and let them decide. So when you talk about sanitary pads and when you talk about menstrual hygiene, do you also then stitch in a conversation about health issues associated with mispractices and myths and uh, ideas that are not necessarily hygienic? Yeah, we do. Uh, see, the simplest thing, here there is this concept of ketarakta, that is impure blood. And you go to any, any school, right, and you just ask them, how many of you think that this is the ketarakta? All the hands will go up, teachers included. If there are some volunteers, they'll also raise their hands. This is impure bad blood. It isn't. It's just something that your body does not require. It's shedding. 
there's nothing impure in it. There are no toxins in it which have to come out of your body like urine or anything else. There's nothing impure in it. Now what happens when you think of this whole process as impure is that you don't take care of your personal hygiene. Absolutely. You don't even talk about it. Why are UTIs so prevalent? Because girls don't want to talk about anything related to it. And also because they don't talk about it, they don't really know what is normal and what yeah. is not. Yeah, and they don't seek help. They would be suffering. They would not seek help. I mean, we've done gynecology screenings in rural, in um, urban so-called slums. And the women come and they've been suffering with UTI for months together and they've never spoken about it. And a lot of these infections lead on to cervical cancer. Yeah, they so do. So are you they able do. to talk about that Absolutely. with the young girls? Absolutely. And how do they respond to this when you, when you talk about the fact that, hey, so... Lack of hygiene can lead to infections, and infection in the long run could lead to cervical yes, cancer. So yes. how, do they, how do they connect with that? When we talk about wide discharge going unnoticed, basically there are, I will not give a talk on menstrual hygiene, the video is something you can watch, but there are certain criteria under which if, if it is so and so, then that is a problem, and you need to go see a doctor. In later stages, if that is not rectified, it could lead to cervical cancer. When we tell them this, we try not to scare them. Because our intention is not to freak them out there, but to tell them that, hey, if this is happening to you or back home to your mothers or sisters, please go seek help. They are very grateful for it, Lakshmi, because they are like, oh, finally, someone is talking to us about it. Okay. Yeah. Now, you've already come a long way with this. What are your goals in this, this space of work? Because I know you, you work in the several different spaces in the development sector. Um, where are you going with this? Where would you like to see yourself go? Yeah, you know, when I started off, it was fairly simple that you want this video to reach out to all the girls in the state and then the country and perhaps outside of it. Someone in Kenya is using the video and they're very excited about it. But now my own thoughts on it have changed and it is more about getting women to start accepting their bodies and to be happy with who they are. Because When you go into government schools, the teachers are telling us that, oh, you know, it's a sad fate that we are all born as girls and as women. And that attitude needs to change. And it's not just about menstruation, it's about your whole body image. Naturally, women might not be perfect. You might be having thunder thighs and you might be, you know, your hair may not be the best and be okay with it. That is not what makes you beautiful. And I want that message to go out so strongly to women. A lot of women need to start feeling good about themselves. We talk about women's safety. I'm also a volunteer counselor with the Women's Helpline. So many people come to us and their issue is that they just don't feel good about themselves. I'm too fat, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too this and I'm too that. And that needs to change. And unless women feel good about themselves, it, it, it really impacts even the whole issue of women's safety. We go out there, any man looks at us, oh my God, we feel fear immediately. And then you become a prey. When you become a prey, there will be a predator. Those are the things I want more and more women to talk about. And it starts with menstruation. If you can't talk about something that is so natural, that is such a biological process. And that you're reminded about every single month almost. And it's, it's, a, it's the beautiful thing that actually equips you to create life. And here we are hushing it all up and not wanting to talk about it. I mean, I asked, I, I did a talk in a, a, a low income household in Gulbarga. And they were all women, 30 women. And one woman who's married and has a child, she asked me, Akka, is there any relationship between this menstruation and having a child? I said, okay. I didn't know how to start there. And I said, no, when you are pregnant, when you go to the doctor, doesn't she tell you anything? She said, no. Why? Because we assume that they're illiterate and they don't understand anything. That doesn't mean they don't deserve to know. Absolutely. They have never been told the significance of menstruation. They think that menstruation is this impure, horrible thing that happens to you, and that there's a childbirth that's an again, again another pain. <laughs> that is the whole attitude towards it. But you're supposed to go through it because it's the right thing to do, yeah. and that's acceptable, and that uh, yeah. makes you a successful, yeah. Yeah. gives you a successful identity as a woman, I suppose, yeah. in Indian society. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one last question for you, Sindhu. Sure. Through these years of interactions, what would you say is your biggest learning on the personal front? That all women, regardless of economic background, go through the same embarrassing moments as an adolescent during your period. So there is no difference there. You and I are all the same. And we need to start going with the attitude that we are all the same. 
not that I'm here to educate somebody. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for encouraging every one of us to speak more. On the Join our mailing list at chaiwithlakshmi.in forward slash subscribe and keep in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus and Pinterest.